Well, we have a lot of a uh, lot of exciting things to talk about here tonight, and uh, passages that um, no doubt will get us thinking. And I think that uh, no doubt is a good thing. If you didn't pick up your handout sheet, it's over there on the music stand, and you want to make sure you get one of those so that you know where we are. I don't have one in front of me. I probably should have one in front of me or else. But So tell me if I cover it. If I didn't cover it, just tell me. <laughs> so we'll just throw it against. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Awesome. Oh, ooh, okay. <laughs> wow, he's in front and back. All right. So... Yeah, I don't know if you had a chance or not to read through Ezekiel chapter 40 on down through um, most of 46. Uh, if you had a chance to read down through that, no doubt you came across an interesting passage of Scripture. Uh, it's a passage of Scripture that's been talked about quite a bit uh, because of the subject matter. The subject is the new temple. And uh, so we're going to talk about trying to identify the new temple understand uh, some of the possibilities for what this is a reference to. Um, tonight, as we look at this, we'll look at this temple aspect and we'll try to understand what it could and couldn't be. And we'll try to understand the implications because once you decide what it is, there are certain implications. And then we're also going to talk about the uh, people who are alive during the millennial kingdom and try to understand the relationships that people have. And we'll be talking about the heavenly city, the, the city of Jerusalem, and trying to make sense of what Ezekiel talks about and what Revelation speaks about, what Hebrews talks about, because there's a great deal there as well. Um, this is more uh, detailed than probably most of us would want to get into. Uh, it, there, are, um, there are theological basises for the interpretations of these passages. And when we all get said and done, um, what we're going to look at, there's going to be some question in our mind, especially when we come to the heavenly city and we talk about that uh, as to you know, time frame wise and so forth. Uh, but I think it's important for us to understand it. I've always been taught these things as a matter of fact. Um, and whenever you get taught something as a matter of fact, this is what it is. There's absolutely no question. And, you know, you go off and generally I believe it and, and that settles it. When you have to come to teach something, however, you begin to understand that there's different point of views, that there's evidence for this over here on one side, evidence for something else on the other side. And so what I want you to do is be familiar with these passages of Scripture and at least be able to, to understand uh, somewhat of, of the application. Um, I'll tell you what I think, and you'll have passages upon passages that you can look up if you want to, uh, to figure it out. So let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll dive in here uh, to the worship in the Millennial Kingdom. Lord, we just want to thank you for the preciousness of your word. We thank you tonight, Father, for bringing us this revelation and giving to us uh, just the amazing realities of the future. Uh, Lord, we're blessed to know that you are a faithful God. We're blessed to know, Lord, that the promises that were given back in the Old Testament, uh, you have not forgotten about. But Lord, you're faithful to do all those things that you've said you were going to do. So help us, Lord, as we, we try to understand these passages in Ezekiel and Revelation. Help us, Father, to, to be able to grasp what uh, the writer's intention is, that we might be able to be encouraged as we leave here tonight. So again, I thank you and praise you for bringing us together this evening. And ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, look in your Bibles with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 40. Ezekiel chapter 40. And verse 1, it says, In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after Jerusalem had been captured, 
On that very day, the Lord's hand was on me, and he brought me there. In visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain. On its southern slope was a structure resembling a city. He brought me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze with linen cord and a measuring rod in his hand. He was standing by the gate, and he spoke to me, Son of man, look with your eyes, listen with your ears, and pay attention to everything I'm going to show you. For you have been brought here so that I might show it to you. Report everything you see to the house of Israel. And that's a translation out of the Holman Bible that um, I just got through reading. Well, the temple is what he ends up seeing. Uh, and he begins to describe there in verse uh, five, the wall and the outer gates. He begins to talk about the measurements of each. And he goes on in verse 28, and he speaks about the inner gates as well. There is great detail in these passages of Scripture. There's uh, rooms in verse 38 uh, for preparing sacrifices. And you see that uh, uh, very Particularly, uh, God has given the measurements of the temple. Uh, the preciseness upon which the Lord has given his holy temple uh, is not unlike the preciseness of the tabernacle as well. God was very specific in the, uh, manu the, the creating of that, the manufacture of all of those components that go into the tabernacle and as well the temple. And you see the, the same thing is pertaining to this temple. And so it's very, very specific how God is laying it all out. And there is great, as I mentioned, detail to the point where some of the measurements, the width in chapter 41 of the entrance was 17 and a half feet. Not 17 feet, not 18 feet, but 17 and a half feet. Uh, God has very specifically given uh, what he wants this to look like to those who will be making it. The priest chambers uh, are talked about there in chapter 42. And uh, again, uh, the outside dimensions of the temple complex are even measured there uh, as well. By the time you come to chapter 43, we have the return of the Lord's glory. He led me to the gate, the one that faces east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice sounded like the roar of mighty waters and the earth shone with his glory. The vision I saw was like one I had seen when he came to destroy the city and like the ones I'd seen by the Shebar Canal. I fell face down. The glory of the Lord entered the temple by way of the gate that faced east. And the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So this is obviously a very exciting time where you have uh, the return of the glory of God, uh, the Shekinah glory of God coming into uh, the temple. So the question is before us, exactly what is Ezekiel looking at? What is he seeing here? Uh, what, what could this possibly be? And I think in your notes there you have five interpretations of this passage. Uh, some think that this, this, these chapters, this passage here, uh, is describing the temple at Jerusalem prior to the Babylonian captivity. Prior to the Babylonian captivity. So when you think about time frame wise and so forth, there are some objections. Um, and when you look at the description that is given here, there are several aspects that really don't line up uh, with the previous temple. So that's, uh, that I don't believe could even be considered here uh, as a possibility. The second one is something these chapters describe the temple in Jerusalem after the return from the 70 years exile in Babylon. But that can't be either because there are more marks of contrast than likeness between the temple here in this passage and the previous one. Remember, we have great details, measurements and so forth, and they're not lining up. Um, there's, there's distinction. Number three, some think they describe the ideal temple that the Jews should have built after the 70 years return. This is what you should have done. There you go. And uh, you should have built it like this. 
I'm not really sure I have to say too much to defend that. Why? So I'm not going to. <laughs> Number four, some think this temple in Ezekiel symbolizes the spiritual blessings of the church in the present age. Some think this temple symbolizes the spiritual blessings of the church in the present age. Who do you think thinks that? Reformed. You're a millennialist. That's right. Because we talked about the spiritualization and so forth, and so they would spiritualize this, and that would be their interpretation. The last view, the fifth view, is that, in the pre- is, is that we have here a, a prediction or a prophecy of the temple that will be built in the millennial age. It appears to be fitting. It's an intelligent sequel to the preceding prophecies. And I think that's, that's pretty accurate. Uh, one of the you know, great theologians of the past, Arno Gablian, or Gablion, uh, said this. He said, the temple which the remnant built does in no way whatsoever correspond with the magnificent structure that Ezekiel beheld in his vision. The fact is, if this temple is a literal building, as it assuredly is, it has never yet been erected. Furthermore, it's distinctly stated that the glory of the Lord returned to the temple and made his dwelling place there, the same glory which Ezekiel had seen departing from the temple and from Jerusalem. But the glory did not return to the second temple. No glory cloud filled that house. Furthermore, no high priest is mentioned in the worship of the temple, Ezekiel describes, but the Jews after their return from Babylon had high priests again. Nor can the stream of healing waters flowing from the temple as seen by Ezekiel be in any way applied to the restoration from the Babylonian captivity. So this is uh, quite uh, unique here in uh, many, many ways, uh, this temple. I believe that as we see this temple here, Um, we have to ask ourselves the question, what's the purpose of a temple like this? You know, what what would be the purpose? Why why would God do that? And let me give you a few uh, reasons for for purposes for this temple. One one of them, and this is a literal temple that we're talking about, one of them is to demonstrate God's holiness, right? So God's holiness had been defiled so many times by the Jewish people over their historical dwelling in the land. And uh, there were more and more times where idolatry and, re- and rebellion was, was pretty much out of control. And so God had pulled back away from these people. And it was a very sad day when the glory of the Lord left the temple. Very sad day. The amazing thing is they didn't even realize that that had happened. So the temple that you have, even during the time of Jesus, when he was walking the earth, when he goes over and kicks the money changers table, and I mean, Jesus is there, but that's the first time God's been in that temple in a long time uh, because his glory had departed from that. And they were very religious. They were very dedicated. They were very sincere. But their ungodliness had caused the glory of the Lord to leave, and it never came back. It never returned. So you never had the fulfillment of what God desired, which was to have a dwelling place with mankind. He has desired that all along. So that's one purpose of the temple. Another is to provide a dwelling place for the divine glory. And uh, if you're looking for a, a, you know, a a scripture verse uh, for that, I believe it's Isaiah um, 43. Verse 7, no, it's Ezekiel 43, 7 and 7 through 12 you could go to. Now, something else we're going to be talking about here in, in just a second, another purpose is to perpetuate the memorial of sacrifice. And that's what you see here by the time you get to chapter 46. We'll talk more about that here in just a second. Let me give you the last two. Number four is to provide the center for the divine government. So we know we have divine government Jesus Christ is on the the throne. So number one, demonstrate God's holiness. Two, it's a dwelling place for the glory of God. Number three, it perpetuates the memorial sacrifice. 
And number four, it's the center for divine government during the millennial kingdom. This is when the glory of God is taken up the residence in the temple and we have Christ ruling and reigning. Number five is to provide victory over the curse. And I like the notes here. From under the threshold of the temple house, the prophet sees a marvelous stream issuing and flowing eastward in ever-increasing volumes of refreshment until it enters a copious fullness into the Dead Sea, whose poisonous waters are healed. Traversing the course of this wondrous, life-giving water, the seer finds both banks clothed with luxuriant growth of trees, of fadeless leaf, and never-failing fruit furnishing both medicine and food. And that's the passage there. Don, you'll appreciate that. It has fishermen in it. That's Ezekiel chapter 47. There are fishing. They are fishing there, and they have even nets. So um, there's lots of good fish uh, that they'll be eating there. All right? Let's go back to number three, purpose uh, for this temple, to perpetuate a memorial service. Perpetuate a memorial, memorial service. And the question is, will there be literal sacrifices during this period of time? If you take a, a look at Ezekiel chapter 46, you see that the sacrifices uh, begin to be offered at appointed times. And uh, he begins talking about this. Um, uh, he says the gate of the inner court that faces east must be closed during the six days of work. But it will be opened on the Sabbath day and opened on the day of the new moon. Now, that's pretty fascinating right there because when you stop and you think about it, you have the whole aspect of the Sabbath reintroduced. Do we have the Sabbath today that we observe? Do we observe the Sabbath? What day is the Sabbath? Saturday. Saturday and technically it would start when it got dark on Friday night and so forth and carry over into the next day they would have in Israel still today they have a Shabbat meal they call it on Friday evening um, they still worship on Saturday Seventh-day Adventists worship on Saturdays we worship on Sundays is there a reason why we worship on Sundays or is it just happened to be the day everybody was available? Do you feel that that's a biblical mandate to worship on Sunday? No? Hmm. So, so is there any biblical, uh, is there a biblical text that we would go to and say we should worship on Sunday? Okay, so in the early church, when did they worship? They worshiped all the time, but they came together specifically. 1 Corinthians 16 talks about the first day of the week. And the point was they were celebrating on the first day of the week what? The resurrection. So technically, every single Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. We have big Resurrection Sunday in, on Easter, we call it or we should throw the word Easter out and just call it the Big Resurrection Sunday. But every other Sunday during the year is Little Resurrection Sunday. So we don't have, we don't have because we're not under the law, the obligation to keep the Sabbath. Uh, in fact, if you look at all the Ten Commandments, there is only one, ten, one of the Ten Commandments that Jesus did not reiterate and say that we need to keep. And which one is that? The Sabbath. Jesus never told anyone to keep the Sabbath. In fact, Jesus irritated people because he didn't keep the Sabbath the way they thought the Sabbath should be kept. Who do you think should be the final authority on how the Sabbath should be kept? God or man? Well, I would, I would defer to God and, and understand that that's his prerogative. But the point is this. During the millennial kingdom here, we're dealing with this passage of Scripture, and that first part, those five views of this portion of Scripture are absolutely critical for the rest of what we're talking about. 
because if we look at this and we say, no, this is truly a passage that extends to the millennial kingdom, that this temple is a real temple and it's real and it's in the millennial kingdom, then everything that we're talking about here goes part and parcel with that, right? So it's all connected. So if you want to take one of those other four views, that this was a past temple or that this is a spiritualized temple, you don't have to address these things. But I think the problem with taking any one of those four views, re really, it's really compounded in a lot of different ways. First of all, the description doesn't match up. Second of all, you have the glory of God in this temple, which didn't happen in every temple. So there's, there's a problem having everything mesh to be able to say it's one of those other things. And you know, I really don't like the spiritual view uh, to equate this to the present day church age. Um, I think that's a, that's a big violation of, of interpretation. So I believe that we're on firm footing when we say this is a millennial temple. If that's true, you see that the Sabbath is reinstituted during the millennial kingdom. Hmm, that's weird, isn't it? I mean, we don't do that. We don't do that, and, and, and we don't do it because the Bible doesn't say we're supposed to do it. It's not that we've jettisoned Sabbath worship because we wanted to do things on Saturdays. Well, it's a pattern. It goes back to creation. The principle of one day's rest and seven, I believe, can be that you can make a case for that extending to us today. But you can't make a case saying that we should remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. All right. And I know that that is kind of probably in the last 30, 40 years, that's pretty much dissipated out. But there are a lot of people who believed that the Sunday had become this new Sabbath and that you needed to be careful about doing different things. I, I remember when I, when I moved to Pennsylvania um, as a seminary student, I had a, a room that I was renting from uh, a widow lady and her mother, and her mother, mother said, you know, listen, you can't wash clothes here at this house on Sundays, okay? We're not doing that. And I thought, you know, that's fine. I respect that. Um, I was just glad they, they still cooked. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, some people back in that time especially were trying to make it an obligation that was somewhat Sabbath-like and apply that to Sunday. Um, now, you can make a whole case for Sunday should be the Lord's Day. And, you know, I, I hear it called a lot of different days. I personally just think the day, I think every day belongs to the Lord, but I think there needs to be time that we set apart for God. I mean, there's nobody going to get so busy up in heaven. They're going to say, listen, I can't rejoice and praise God today. Uh, I did that for the last 4,000 years, and I need a day off. Um, we're going to just keep right on rolling, aren't we? But um, you know what I mean. So during this millennial kingdom, we have Sabbath worship uh, reintroduced here in chapter 46. And, and that in itself is interesting. How do we reconcile that? Uh, how do we understand that? Uh, if this is if this is real, it seems to go against the New Testament, doesn't it? Doesn't it? Where where would you go in the New Testament to to have an issue with this? A any any passages in the New Testament that pop out to you? Maybe in Romans. <laughs> There are some who prefer certain days, Paul says, and esteem one day higher than the next. Paul says, if you want to do that, that's fine, but it's not a legal requirement. And he's making the case for that. And so we have to be very careful. We're looking at this and we're saying, well, how do we, how do we fit this together? How do we reconcile it? Well, even more significant, if you go down through this passage here in ver chapter 46, in verse uh, 4, the burnt offering that the prince presents the Lord on the Sabbath day is to be six unblemished lambs and an unblemished, unblemished ram. What in the world? We're talking about blood sacrifice now. Blood sacrifice. And so how do you wrap your head around the whole issue of 
sacrifices being brought into the temple once again, along with the Sabbath day uh, being kept. And how do you reconcile that uh, with the church age? I mean, how, how are we supposed to understand this um, is the main question here. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but let's first of all uh, take a look at what the purpose is for the sacrifices are all about. What's the purpose? Uh, why would God uh, do this in the very first part? Well, when you look at this, the purpose of the sacrifices, number one, is that it's observed in such a way that it has no relation to the question of expiation, which means the taking away of sins. If you want that big word. We, I think we talked about justification, expiation on a Sunday morning a few weeks ago. Expiation, ex, take out, take out from, taking away the sin, taking the sin off, expiation. It is not in any way having a view towards salvation from sin. It is not. Back in the Old Testament, when the animals were sacrificed, what relationship did that sacrifice have to sin? It covered the sin. It covered the sin. So there was an atonement that was made. And so our holy God would have a relationship with a very unholy people, right? And that was the whole reason for that. The blood of sheep and goats not, according to Hebrews, able to remove the sin, but it was able to cover the sin. There was a view of those sacrifices. When you were offering those sacrifices, it wasn't the end game. All right, it wasn't the end game. What was the end game? In the Jewish priest's mind, what, what's the end game back in the Old Testament? The coming Messiah. The coming Messiah. And that mes the Messiah would come... And these sins that were covered would then be finally removed. So that was the exciting anticipation that the Jewish people had. Now, have. But I was just going to say, that's a good point, Al. They, they have it and they don't have it. Their view of Messiah is that Messiah will bring peace. I remember witnessing in 1985 to a fellow by the name of Isaac who ran the repair shop down the road. And I was sharing the gospel with him, and he said, no, no, he said, Jesus can't be the Messiah. He cannot be the Messiah. And I said, well, why not? Look at all the world. It's all war, and there's no peace. When Jesus Christ comes, the word, wait, wait, say, he didn't say Jesus. He said, the Messiah comes, there will be peace. And that was his criteria for understanding the Messiah has come. Now, you and I know from our studies in prophecy how dangerous that is because one of the first things that the one world leader, i.e. the Antichrist, will do is cause there to be a peace treaty with Israel. And so their, their expectation that they currently have will be met. If you go all the way back, however, to the Old Testament, I think the understanding was different than the current Orthodox Jew has today who believes that Messiah is all about peace. The Old Testament high priest, I believe, had a view towards expiation. They looked at the realistic um, emancipation from sin that the Messiah would bring. Uh, and when you think of the sacrificial system, once again, it just kept the relationship going, okay? Again, we have a holy God, and he gives the law so that an unholy people will know how to live in relationship to him. They had no idea. Do we have an idea how we should live with a holy God whose Holy Spirit lives within us? Well, hopefully we do. Hopefully we have an understanding. Hopefully we, we rely upon the grace of God and ask for forgiveness when we sin and know that 
our sin is washed away as far as the east is from the west, and we have a right relationship then with our God. We are so blessed, aren't we? I mean, we are so blessed because the sacrificial system is not part of our thought process. Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. He was offered once for all. Once for all. That's all that it took in order to remove the sin. And I can have full forgiveness of sin because of what Jesus Christ has done. So let me just give you the the second point here with regard to the purpose of these sacrifices. The sacrifices will be memorial in character. They're memorial. It will remind the Jewish people of what went on during the times when they had a temple in the past. And because Christ is there, having paid for the sins of the whole world, there will be a tremendous um, commemoration of what Christ has done. Now, I I think the easiest way for us to to link this thought, uh, let me just read this little paragraph speaking here about the Lord's Supper. Because when we observe the Lord's Supper, we observe it, it's symbolic, isn't it? It's symbolic. The bread represents the body, the the juice, the blood of Christ. Um, We are not Romanish in our thought process, which would basically say the blood is, or the cup is the blood of Christ, or the bread is the body of Christ. Um, For those who would do that, they are crucifying afresh Jesus Christ. And Christ has only needed to be crucified one time, and that settled it. So we're not talking in any way, shape, or form, even here with regard to the sacrificial uh, aspect of the temple worship here. We're not talking about reintroducing uh, blood that washes away sin. Okay, so I just got to be really careful to point that out but let me read this in the lord's supper we commemorate christ's death we all together repudiate the popish doctrine of a repetition of the offering of christ we do not believe in any such removal of the sacrifice but we gratefully obey the command of christ to commemorate his death in such a way that both an external memorial is presented to the world and an outward and visible sign and seal given to the believing partaker May not a similar plan succeed the Lord's Supper, which we know shall cease at Christ's coming. So that's the question. Even the church has as yet only a superficial knowledge of the treasures of wisdom and the Levitical institutions and its symbols. There's a lot of symbolism that goes back into the sacrificial system. God is so detailed, and he gave those priests Uh, so much detail and how they were supposed to execute the sacrificial system that all of that had no doubt tremendous uh, tremendous truth behind it Uh, and whether they fully understood it or not remains to be seen but during this millennial kingdom and during this worship here this temple I believe that they will be able to see it and so we we have hard and fast objects this past Sunday we just took communion Lord's Supper's taken. Was that real grape juice? Well, it was something, right? I mean, it was real, whatever it was. And, and was that real bread, unleavened bread? Well, it tasted it to me. I mean, the point is, though, it's, it was real juice and it was real bread. Uh, those two things are external, and yet they provide a memorial for us, don't they? And it's interesting that the Bible would give to the church that important aspect of the memorial. If you read through the scriptures, though, God is all about doing the memorial thing, isn't he? Uh, He really is. Uh, You go back to when the people of Israel crossed into the promised land. There were memorials, build us stones here, and don't forget, build the altar, the schismatic altar. It reminds you of this, and over here we're going to build this. and, And there were memorials all over the place. And this is a testament here to the work of Christ. And I think it's um, pretty, pretty significant. Now, let me give you a couple of objections. All right. I object. Your honor, I object. Um, There are some who would look at this and think, 
and, and you're not far off if, if this is your thinking, that in Hebrews, it tells us there that Christ once was offered the acceptable sacrifice to God. And his sacrifice need not be repeated. And there are those who might allege that this sacrifice, these sacrifices during this time period are, are taking away from the sacrifice of Christ. But I remind you that what we're not saying, and at no point is the inference given in Ezekiel's prophecy, there's never a point where the payment for sin is being made. There's no atonement. There's no covering. There's none of that. It's just sheer memorial. And so because of that, I think it's not um, a major inconsistency with Hebrews. Here's the big thought process in my mind. The big process in my mind is that as we look at the world and as we look at the timeline and the prophecy timeline um, we, we live here and it's the the age of grace and um, we understand there's there's no division between jew and gentile jew and gentile today put their faith in jesus christ where do they both go they're immersed into the body of christ right that's where they are they're immersed into the body of christ this is the age of grace and uh, it ends here with the rapture began all the way back here with Pentecost but before before Pentecost uh, this was all about the Jewish history uh, wasn't it the Jewish people uh, right from Abraham on up through the law going through the prophets it's all about the nation of Israel when you come to the tribulation you have seven years of tribulation who's at the focal point of the tribulation, the people of God who were chosen, the Israelites. Uh, they're the ones who are that focal group. Uh, it is the time of Jacob's trouble. And the desire here is for them to repent and come back to God through Jesus Christ. And we know that many do. So this is Jewish. This is Jewish. This is Gentile. And then the millennial kingdom that thousand years uh, really is Jewish even though there will be Gentiles who will be in the millennial kingdom we find that their role in the millennial kingdom is a notch below that of the Jewish people and so we see Jerusalem as at the epicenter of this millennial kingdom we have Jesus uh, the king uh, ruling and reigning we have David, his regent. Uh, we have the 12 disciples over the 12 tribes uh, involved in, in ruling and reigning as well. It's very, very Jewish. Uh, and so understanding how these dispensations work, um, I'm dispensational in my theology as opposed to covenant in my theology. I see that God has given at times revelation to man who has then uh, had a responsibility uh, to handle that revelation. And at different times, you can go all the way back through and you can look at uh, these different time frames that we call dispensations where God is working with people. By the time you come out here, this is predominantly Jewish. Would these sacrifices uh, be reinstituted here during the age of grace? The answer is no, because it would not pertain to us. And it would create enormous difficulties for us if all of a sudden we were told that we're going to from now on observe the Sabbath. But understand this, that during this dispensation here, there is no problem with that because the Jews are at the epicenter of it all. And there's not a, a, a disconnect uh, because of the different dispensations. So I think as you, you look at this, you're not seeing um, an enormous conflict between uh, Hebrews 8, uh, verses 8 through 13, um, and what Ezekiel is talking about. Uh, you see the opportunity for this all to, to mesh here uh, without, without difficulty. Now, during this 
time period, you see salvation in the millennial kingdom. Um, and just a couple points here. If you looked at J uh, Jeremiah 31, <coughs> and I'll look that up for you here. Somebody take Jeremiah out of my Bible. <laughs> this study Bible has these little cheater tabs on the sides. So that way, yeah, this is, this is a terrific study Bible. It's got those barcodes in it. And so I always figure, well, worse comes to worse. If I don't know what this passage means, I'll just take the smartphone, put it over the barcode, and do the barcode reader. And then up on my smartphone pops Dr. Gene Getz teaching on the passage. Then I can just turn around and show you. <laughs> so if you have questions, it'll be like, okay, there's Dr. Getz. Um, chapter 31, uh, and looking here at verse 31, <clears throat> talking about the new covenant. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. This one will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke even though I had married them, uh, the Lord's declaration. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will one teach his neighbor or his brother saying, know the Lord, for they'll all know me from the least to the greatest of them. This is the Lord's declaration. I'll forgive their wrongdoing and never again remember their sin. Uh, so wonderful spiritual rebirth here for the people uh, of Israel. And they will have a knowledge of salvation, um, and God will give them a new heart. Um, we could get tracked. Um, we, we could track in a lot of different directions when he's talking about those covenants, but I won't go into those covenants but in keeping with the primary covenants, uh, the sacrifices um, kind of mesh right in there uh, very well. It's not reinstituting the Mosaic uh, priesthood and so forth. Um, the Mosaic covenant was different than the other covenants, so there's not a problem there. But that's getting more and more into the weeds. Again, salvation in the Millennial Kingdom. Um, the new covenant that he speaks about here guarantees all who enter this millennium and all who are born in the millennium and thus who need salvation the opportunity. So everyone will have that opportunity. This new uh, covenant um, is, is part of a result of the new heart that the people have, the forgiveness of sins that I just read, Jeremiah 31, 34. And also Joel talks about the fullness of the Spirit. Uh, so the New Testament makes it really clear um, that the new covenant is based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of these people will receive salvation during the millennium by faith, just as they have always been justified. So there's nothing new as far as that goes. Right, right. Sure. Um, God wants them to, first of all, and most importantly, have a new heart. And the only way they're going to have a new heart is by faith in Jesus. Um, but most of them will put their faith in Jesus. Um, that's not the problem. The result of their faith will lead to the memorial. Just like for us, we take communion as a memorial, but we're, we're not um, aligned with every church that takes communion that way. In other words, there are other churches where communion is a means of grace leading to salvation. So you could have the same error 
Um, could there potentially be someone who says, well, you know, I'm bringing my sacrifice up here and I, I'll bring my sacrifice up and it'll get me to heaven? Well, sure, but that's the same thing today. So if you go to certain churches on Sunday, they're taking the Lord's Supper thinking it's giving them grace. We're taking it and saying, no, it's a memorial. So during the millennial kingdom, even though these animals are sacrificed, the purpose is not for expiation. It's, it's not for salvation. It's for, uh, for a memorial. Regardless of how everybody perceives it, that's the intention. Yeah. Does that make sense? So, um, again, you're saved by faith. Faith is always the catalyst for salvation. Whether it was back in Abraham's time, as reported in Romans chapter 4, um, or for us today, or for uh, the people who are born in the millennial kingdom, it'll always come down to faith, and it always comes down to an individual's faith. Uh, there is no other way for a person to be justified. Rob? Yes, yes. Um, and you can't sacrifice fish, but you can eat them. <laughs> so they might have a sale on fish sticks during the millennial kingdom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Other questions? Th this is kind of our break point here. So, yeah, Bob. Ah, there you go. I like that. That's, that's better than our Sunday. Yeah. People here today, they think sun. They think, ah, it's Sunday. I can go fishing. <laughs> yeah, football. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Any other questions about the sacrificial system that's, that's here, these sacrifices that are made? I don't... Uh, I, I, I'm sure there, there's other things that we're missing, but um, y I think you get the, the general understanding of it at this point. So let's move on then. Um, let's talk here about the relation between the living and the resurrected saints uh, during the millennium. The nature of the millennium Sure, I have all my all my notes. When we think of how we, as the church, for instance, during the millennial kingdom, will relate to others, I had someone ask me a question about this one night after the Bible study. Uh, they asked me, so are we going to be walking around on the earth in our glorified bodies, kind of mixing it up with the other people who have regular physical bodies like we do today? I mean, how is that supposed to work? And, uh, you know, how, how, do, how does that all happen? Um, in the notes, uh, the statements made, there's a confusion even among premillennialists concerning the relationship. And when we stop and we think about it, there are some simple answers that are given, but they don't necessarily answer all the questions. For instance, um, oftentimes this question gets dismissed by saying, well, the Lord in his glorified state was able to walk around and mingle around with people who were flesh and blood. Um, and if he could do that in his resurrection body, we should have no difficulty doing that uh, either. Um, however, that seems somewhat dismissive of the, the problem here. It seems like there's uh, some, some bigger issues at hand when we try to figure all of this, this out. So what I want to do uh, is take a look at some of the aspects here. And let me see what you've got for your notes. You've got understanding some things here about the, the church 
we know that the church is going to reign certainly as the bride of Christ. Uh, there's implications uh, when looking at Revelation with regard to this, and we'll, we'll talk about the holy city here in a moment. The Old Testament saints, we agree, uh, they're to be resurrected and rewarded uh, during this, this time period. So we would understand, we would understand that. And we would also uh, understand that the saved Jews um, who go into the millennial kingdom um, are going to be the subjects in the millennial kingdom. So we have, uh, during this thousand-year reign, we have uh, resurrected um, believers who are somewhere, uh, we're resurrected and given glorified bodies uh, at the time of the rapture. Uh, there are Jews and Gentiles who are saved, who will, after the judgment of the sheep and goats, go into the millennial kingdom. Uh, these people are the subjects of the millennial kingdom, but we're not. We also have Old Testament saints who have been resurrected at the mid or right here between the seven year tribulation and the thousand year uh, millennial kingdom. And they've been given glorified bodies too. We have the tribulation saints, they've been resurrected and given glorified bodies. So we have this group here. Uh, of people who are not in physical bodies, and then we have the Gentiles and the Jews who are saved, who go through that judgment, who are part of the millennial kingdom. Again, these are the subjects, and how do these two main groups here relate? Now, they're all part of what we would understand as the first resurrection, right? The, the first resurrection. If you're, if you're resurrected at any points of the, these different points, you're part of the first resurrection. There's a first resurrection, a second resurrection. Everyone who's part of the first resurrection will spend their eternity in heaven. And everyone who's part of the second resurrection will be resurrected for the great white throne judgment. And upon the verdict being guilty, they will be cast into the lake of fire. So you definitely want to be part of the first resurrection, don't you? You absolutely, absolutely do. And, and so that's, a, that's pretty important, right? Um, and that's what, uh, as we would understand it, when we place our faith in, in Jesus Christ, that is the, the reality. That's, that's what we see uh, happening. So what is the relationship then like? The thousand-year reign is that administration of the divine government on earth. The earthly center is Jerusalem, and we've talked about that. But we have people with resurrected bodies, and we have people without resurrected bodies. We've got to try to figure out how to put that all together. So, again, these are some of the challenges, right? So you're starting to get into some of the things that are a little bit more complicated. <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that it's, well, it's just a simple thing, and I can give you a quick answer, and we can close in prayer and go home. Um, but it, it just, it's just not that simple. What I want to do, though, is give you... Um, what the thousand-year reign is all about. The thousand-year reign, again, it's that direct administration of the divine government on earth for a thousand years. What this looks like depends who you are. For instance, from God the Father's side, it will be the public honoring of Jesus Christ where men dishonored Jesus when he came, here he's going to be honored. It's going to carry out God's promises then to his son. He's going to give unto him the throne of his father David. It's the final divine trial of sinful man on this earth before the earth is destroyed. And so man will have the opportunity uh, to trust in Christ and be justified and go from the millennial kingdom into the heavenly realm. Not everyone will do that. It will be God's answer 
to the prayer of the saints. And so as God looks at this, there's some wonderful things happening. God the Father looks at this, and, and he must be so pleased during the millennial kingdom uh, that Jesus is there on the throne being received by man uh, as he should have been the first time. Isn't it? I mean, it's pretty wonderful. From Christ's perspective, as Jesus looks at this, he receives, after a long time, the kingdom of this world that was promised to him as well. Remember when Satan takes him up, says, here you go. You want it all. Here it is. Just throw yourself off. And uh, Jesus said, no, I, I'm not going to do that. Well, finally, at this point in time, Jesus is, from his perspective, seated on his rightful throne. And he's going to be able to confer upon the meek of the earth, the place, the inheritance that he loved to promise them. So that's exciting, too, if you're Jesus. Uh, Jesus taught the Beatitudes. He taught about the future kingdom. And there were so many places, if you read through the Gospels, next time you read through the Gospels, read through the eyes of, of one who's looking for the kingdom, and you'll be amazed at how many references and how many passages uh, apply to the kingdom. And here Jesus is finally realizing this. You know, the, the meek will inherit the earth. Well, here's the meek. Oh, this, this is great. You know, it's finally come to pass. Um, he'll share all his kingly honors uh, with the saints. And so that, that's pretty exciting. Now, from the saints' perspective, the millennium brings three classes of saints and also earthly Israel into a state of tremendous blessedness. Three classes of saints. Tribulation saints, Old Testament saints, and church aid saints. Those are the three classes of saints. And then the very physical changes made in the earth reveal a little of the loving care of God um, that he's bestowing on his saints. How about from the nation's perspective, the peoples of the earth? It's going to be a thousand years under the iron rod scepter of Jesus Christ. One thousand years with Christ on the throne. And some of the nations, um, you know, the, Ezekiel talks about the importance. Zechariah talks about the importance. And Zechariah says, listen, if Egypt doesn't come up and offer these sacrifices at the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles, they're going to get cut off. And so it's very important. These nations are going to look at uh, what's going on here, and they will have to respond as, as God wants them to respond. There's going to be peace at last among the nations. It's enforced, and it's real. There will be a rebellion at the end of the millennial kingdom when Satan is let out of the abyss. The Bible says he's let out for a short period of time. He goes and deceives millions upon millions. They don't even, it, it, you can't even count them all. It's like the sand by the seashore. Um, but until that time, there is peace. All nations are compelled to go up year to year to worship uh, the Lord, keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Looked at from the side of creation, creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. That's Romans 8, 20 through 22. So at the revealing of the sons of God, at Christ coming back to earth, this deliverance will be affected. There's, there's a... There's a big change that's coming. We don't realize the significance of, of sin. If there's something, I, I mentioned like climate change on Sunday, so nobody got mad at me. Um, but the reality is we live in a fallen world that is under decay. The Bible talks about this planet is groaning under the pressure of sin. And I have a hard time believing my hairspray does it. Uh, when it comes to climate change. I don't use hairspray, but yeah, you know what I mean. Um, last bottle of hairspray I got from Craig. So, yeah. <laughs> he said he didn't need it anymore, so, you know. Um, but listen, this planet is, is under pressure, isn't it? It's under tremendous pressure, and it's, it's failing. It's failing. And uh, I find it interesting as, as man looks around, they try to figure out how do we stop this from happening. And I don't know. I mean, I, I look at the world. The world's a lot different than when I was a kid. I mean, there's a lot less fun stuff in the world today. I used to swim in the ocean without 
thoughts of great white sharks for the most part. And now they're like all over the place. Y have you ever known? I mean, we, we talk about this, the tick-borne illnesses and we talk about like different things in the world. It just seems like, wow, the place is kind of coming unglued if you ask me. Um, it, it's, and I don't know, is, is, is it due to the processes of sin and just the, the weight of sin on this uh, planet? But when creation itself, and, and the, the Lord personifies creation uh, in the scriptures. So we're kind of personifying it here. From creation's perspective, it's looking and realizing that everything is different now. And that's pretty fascinating as well. So there's a lot of different perspectives here. Um, and how you fit all of these things together then is, is pretty much the key. Now, the occupants of heavenly Jerusalem, there are, there are a lot of passages of Scripture um, that, that we could take a look at. Hebrews, for instance, chapter 11, verse 10, uh, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker uh, is God. Uh, speaking there of Abraham looking forward, um, that was the expectation not only of, of him, but also other Old Testament saints. Hebrews eleven sixteen says, By now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one, Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. And it is observed that the hope of these heroes of faith, according to this verse, was a heavenly city. And so scripture upon scripture speaks of that which is yet future. Galatians 4, uh, verse 26, where it's called Jerusalem, which is above. Revelation 3, 12, it's called the city of my God. And Revelation chapter 20 and chapter 21 is where I'd like you to take a look uh, at this point. So, so, uh, so the question's asked, is this after the millennial kingdom by the time you come to Revelation chapter 20? Well, that's a, a terrific um, question, actually, uh, because as we look at this, there's some debate over what exactly is this a, a reference of? What, what exactly are we, are we talking about here? Um, and there's, there's some good points here that, that should be discussed. Revelation, what did I say, 20? 20, 21, um, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. When the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth, it's sometimes confusing. New heaven, new earth. What, what do you mean, new earth, okay? And because it, it's talked about, like, chronologically at the very end. And it's like, well, is God going to create a new heaven and a new earth? It's important that we understand it this way, I believe. The place where we'll all dwell for eternity is a new heaven, but it's also our new earth in the sense that it's our dwelling place. Not two entities, one entity, but it's our future dwelling place. So when you come to Revelation chapter 21, for instance, Pentecost in his book, Things to Come, he, is, uh, he builds an entire argument over uh, the possibility uh, that the heavenly city that is discussed here in Revelation uh, is populated by the good angels, the Old Testament and tribulation saints, as well as the resurrected church age saints. So that's... He's, he's building that case and he's saying, this is that heavenly city. This is where these will live during the millennial kingdom. So he saw a new heaven and a new earth first heaven and the first earth passed away. They would reference that and say that that is a reference 
to what happened here. Remember, there's huge topography changes on the earth. And they would say that that's where that has taken place. So that's passed away. And now we have a new heaven and a new earth. Okay? Uh, and what they're, what they're trying to say, um, the heavens are, oftentimes we refer to the heavens as the sky and the first, second, and third heaven. And there's a new earth. There's no question that by the time you come to the millennial kingdom, you could quantify that and say that is a new earth because it's very different uh, from the earth that has been ravaged by the judgment of God for those seven years. So that's, that's probably the, the thinking there. Um, he goes on and he says that he saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of the heavens from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And basically what Pentecost is doing, and there's, there's, a, there's some good heavyweight theologians, and I, I'm not sure, um, by the time I'm done, I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'm not sure what it is. But he sees, he sees this heavenly city um, that is coming down as suspended over the earth. And he sees that as the dwelling place of this group here. So this group is primarily dwelling here with the ability upon necessity to come down to the earth so that if there's the ruling and the reigning, they can go between. Uh, yeah. That's the cube that's described there with the New Jerusalem, right? And it's referred to as the New Jerusalem. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's a view that, that, as I say, a good number of premillennialists um, will, will hold to. And for sake of time, I mean, I just, um, I, I can't go through all of the arguments for and against it. Um, but you, you can make a case for it. Uh, with, without too much trouble, you can make a case for it. Um, but there's, there's certainly question marks. So there's, there's some substantial, I think, I think there's some substantial uh, question marks. And I, so they would say that that occurs. Basically, Revelation uh, 21 is going to occur here at the beginning of the Millennial Kingdom. But, well, let me caution you because one of, one, of, one of the big objections is the chronology of Revelation. Revelation is not always, it's not chronological always, okay? So there are certain places where, that's why when you, when you draw out the timeline for the seven years of tribulation and you've got, you know, the, the seal judgments here and then you've got one seal judgment here, and one seal judgment here, and then you've got, uh, oh, yeah, here's the trumpet judgments, and then here's trumpet judgments, and then you got, okay, do you follow me? So it's, they, they kind of, time frame-wise, they're not boom, 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 and then the next seven, boom, 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 and the next seven, boom, boom, boom. There's three sevens, right? Seals and trumpets and vials and the bowl judgments, but they don't always line right up. But... I don't think it's wise when you come to chapter 21 of Revelation after you've gotten through the end of the millennial kingdom earlier in Revelation to go back and bring it in. So I would say, even though this is what I was taught um, as a boy, uh, I, I don't know is that is an airtight uh, argument. OK, so before you walk out of here tonight and you say, OK, great, heaven's going to be down there and we're going to be able to do. I, I, let me just read for you um, a, a, a paragraph here. This is from uh, the Revelation of Jesus, Jesus Christ. This is Walbert's book. Remember, I said uh, things to come by Pentecost. Great book. But pick up this one. This is a phenomenal book. Everybody should have it. Revelation of Jesus Christ for, by Walbert. Moody Press. 
She got them through Amazon, and they were dirt cheap. They were, they're used. Nobody reads books anymore. So you get them, and, and you'll want these books. I mean, these, these are phenomenal books. They give you the passage. Here's the, the verses, and then they explain it. I like that. Right on the same page. Revelation of Jesus Christ. John Walverd W. John. Here's what he says. He says, as demonstrated in the exposition of this passage, we, he gets through ex ex exegeting uh, a particular passage. He says, there is insu insufficient support for chronologically placing this scene, the Revelation 21, as contemporary, I'm going to spell that in my mind all night, contemporaneously uh, with the millennium. The New Jerusalem apparently is seen here as it will be in eternity future after the millennium has been completed. Now that would be my view that by the time you come to Revelation chapter 21, that this is an illustration of, of heaven, okay? Um, I think that when we stop and we think about this, there could be some possibilities. And he says, however, as previously intimated, there is a possibility that the holy city will also be in existence during the millennium, and though not described in that character, in this passage may indeed be the dwelling place of the res resurrected and translated saints during the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. Okay? So it's eternity future uh, that is in view. So in interpreting the description of the heavenly city, the problem of symbolic interpretation comes to the fore eh? perhaps more in than any other section of Revelation here. And that's why some will say, that, well, that we don't know if this could be a literal heaven. Okay? The problem for me is I don't know, I don't think this comes down during this period of time so that they can go between. Although that's kind of a fanciful way. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting and uh, makes me think it would be pretty cool. Yeah, the gates are always open. <laughs> but I think... I agree with Walfer, Walvert in this. I don't know how many Christians will comprise the age of grace because I don't know how long until the rapture of the church takes place. But you know the number is enormous, right? The number of people who have come to Christ, um, pretty significant. I mean, they estimate 100 million people right now in China alone that are born-again Christians, right? So that's awesome. Uh, and so there are millions and millions of people who are going to be populating somewhere, all right? And the three of us, these three classes of saints, have to live somewhere. And my view has always been now that they would live in heaven. I believe that the vast majority of us will live in heaven during the millennial kingdom. Uh, some will rule and reign. But I don't believe, this is just me, I don't believe everyone will rule and reign. I believe that some will. And the rest of us will be in heaven. And eventually, at the conclusion, uh, I see this more so as a time when this is coming down out of heaven uh, at the close of the millennial kingdom, after the final battle, and uh, the, the righteous uh, come up into the, the heavenly kingdom or the heaven uh, until the end of time, all right, which never ends. So uh, I, I see that as happening. Then I see when Peter is talking about how the earth uh, vanishes because of intensive heat and so forth, I see that as destroying this world once and for all, and it's done. Um, so that's kind of how I, how I understand this. So my view of Revelation chapter 21 is this is a reference to heaven. It's references yet, yet future, could be in existence very well uh, during the time of the millennial kingdom. And I don't know why it wouldn't be because heaven's in existence right now, right? So something for you definitely to, to think about. So how much interaction is there? 
I don't think that during this millennial kingdom, the three classes of saints are just going to be walking around. You know, we're not going to sit there and go, you know, I've never seen the Grand Canyon. I think I'll walk over there. There's a thousand years. I can get there and back in 300. Um, I, bet, I, I, I don't know how that'll all work out, but I don't think, I, I don't envision us um, interacting that way during this period of time. So there's, there's always questions. Yeah, yeah, but what does it say? It says this holy city Jerusalem is actually coming down from heaven, right? So, right, so I, I kind of view that as more or less this is the holy city that will be, uh, it'll be featured during heaven in, in the throne of God and so forth. That's my guess, but I'm guessing that heaven itself is quite likely much more vast. Or you never know, because God could just make us small. <laughs> so this is the width of it. You guys are all wigged out, but you know what? You're going to be one half of one centimeter tile, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> He's got the whole universe, and if he needs to create more space, Jesus said, I'm going to heaven, and he, and he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And this is the result of what he's been doing as he's prepared a place for us. And you know that the preparations of, of God are more than adequate and more than sufficient. So that we can rest our faith on. So, good. How does that relate to paradise and the rapture? So um, the, the short version is that during the, du during the time previous to uh, Christ's death and resurrection, there were two realms of the dead. So you had Sheol or Hades, the realm of the dead, Great example is when Jesus is talking about Lazarus and the rich man. They go to two different places. After Jesus' ministry, uh, Christ carries off the captivity, takes, cap, you know, takes captive the, the captives, and, and you have the emptying of the righteous side of the realm of the dead, and they go into the presence of the Lord in what we would understand as paradise. Um, paradise uh, is without a doubt, sometimes, it's sometimes confusing when you look at it because you, you, you try to figure out, well, what does that mean? Um, I would understand it to be in the presence of the Lord. And so that's why when Jesus can say to the thief on the cross, you're going to be with me in paradise, you're in, in heaven with me. Uh, if I die today, I'll go to heaven, okay? I won't go to the realm of the dead. I won't go where Lazarus went. Okay, because it's made possible through the work of Christ for me to go directly into the presence of our holy God. And that was not possible before Jesus completed his work on the cross and resurrected from the dead. So that's the uh, kind of the, the difference there. Um, meanwhile, on the other side of the realm of the dead, these people today who die go to the place where the rich man was and they stay there until the end of the millennial kingdom they stay all the way to the very end and even the people who die during the tribulation they go into Hades they go into Sheol they they're in the realm of the dead they remain there until the very end when they are resurrected themselves but they're part of the second resurrection so they're resurrected, but they're resurrected for the purpose of judgment. And then they are cast into the lake of fire. So that's the, that's the difference. Um, uh, but exciting when Jesus, you know, takes captivity and gets them out of there. And uh, they're in the presence of the Lord. What, what a blessing. Uh, what a blessing that is. So 
and uh, eventually we will be resurrected ourselves and given glorified bodies and then throughout that whole millennial kingdom we have to live somewhere so um, I think heaven's a great place to live <laughs> during the seven years we're up in heaven and there's no doubt there's a lot of activities there's certain things that will be going on and I, I think that that period of time um, for us the church up there uh, in the heavens with the Lord um, we will be experiencing some neat things whether that's the uh, judgment seat of Christ right when we, after we get there along with the marriage supper of the Lamb um, there's some some pretty positive things there reuniting with loved ones and so forth so Yep. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Any other questions that I can't answer? <laughs> I take the questions. I never said I for sure could answer anything. Okay, say that again. There, Ben's asking about a murder during the Millennial Kingdom. Oh. All right, so, so somebody gets murdered in the Millennial Kingdom. An unbeliever. A, an unbeliever murders a believer. The believer will go to heaven. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> All right, I, uncle, let's pray. <laughs> oh, that's, you know, that's the second question I was asked today that I could not answer. So somebody called me today and they said, can you tell me what happens in this situation? <clears throat> and it's one of these really complex counseling scenarios. And I thought, well, I'll give you an answer because I know this person well enough, they always like an answer. They have to have an answer. So I gave them an answer, and 15 minutes later I said, delay that answer. I'm not really sure, but I'll find out. <laughs> if it's possible, I'll try to find out. Uh, so somebody who's a... <laughs> maybe there won't be any. No. Well, I mean, if I get murdered on my way home, I will go to heaven, and the per person that murdered me will go to heaven or hell, depending on whether they're safe. Safe people do kill safe people. So, yeah. But his point, his point, I don't even want to tell you what I'm thinking, because you're all going to go, what? So, so I'm looking for another, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there's another resurrection. I'm trying to figure out where there's another resurrection. So, so now you've got me kind of stumped. So if there's not another resurrection, then there can't be a murder in the millennial kingdom. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So are you in, you're inferring that maybe somebody would be found and so they'd be resurrected at that point and, and then, but that's the only answer you can give. Right. right. That's the only answer. But I've never, ref, I've never heard that ref, referenced in the context of a believer, but it, there's nowhere else you can go. So there's either no murders or that's where someone is resurrected and they go, oh yeah, look, your name is found. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> belated first resurrection. We know that every single believer of those three classes of saints is part of the first resurrection. Wait, 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 so then, then there will be death during the thousand years? Oh, there will be death during the thousand years. Okay, so then 
But for the most part, the people who die are going to be wicked people. They're cut off. So, um, but, but it's not... But it's not m necessarily my understanding that that everyone's going to live a thousand years. Yeah, but it's 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 just like today, right? I mean, in the sense that if your physical body dies, you, yeah. All right, good questions we can't answer. All right. <laughs> the Bible says, these things have I given to you that you might be able to figure it out, and the things I haven't given to you, don't worry about it. That's Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. <laughs> so the secret things belong unto God, but I've chosen to reveal to those things that you can understand. So just be cool with that. Write Deuteronomy 29 down so you, you don't call me tomorrow. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Thank you so much. Let's have a word of prayer, shall we? God, we just give you thanks for the reasons and the answers and the theology that, that's there in your word. Um, but most importantly, Father, help us to, to focus on the reality of our Savior in our life today. Lord, how thankful we are. Um, it's great to know these future events, to understand them, Lord. Uh, but, Father, help us today just to, to again, be, be met with your, your love and your grace as we see it demonstrated uh, either, even in future events. Lord, we thank you that you are righteous. You are just. And even questions, Lord, like these that we're not really privy to the answers of, uh, Lord, we, we rest them in you, knowing that you are uh, truly righteous. And so we pray, Father, that uh, we would be encouraged by the reality of the future. Help us, Lord, to rest in you uh, amidst uh, a world that's filled with trials, Lord. Um, may, may we sleep well tonight knowing that we're well cared for. So again, I thank you and praise you for the opportunity to study your word these few weeks and pray your blessing on each one, Lord, as we go our separate ways tonight. Give you glory for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My pleasure. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs>